If you are new here, welcome to City Point. You found yourself in a really awesome church this morning. Do me a favor, there's a connect card in the seat pockets in front of you. Fill that thing out and turn it in at the welcome desk on your way out. We'd love to get to know you uh, and love to get to know who you are. But today is Palm Sunday. Can you believe it? We're already in April of 2022, and we're on, you know, the, the week before Jesus was uh, crucified and rose from the dead, Palm Sunday. And I just, I love the imagery when you read the scripture of the triumphal entry and Jesus coming up the Mount of Olives and, and coming down the other side, and he's looking at Jerusalem, man, and it's almost like, man, he is in his home stretch. Jesus is at the finish line getting ready to go into his destiny, and I just, I love the imagery, but as this year, as I was reading this scripture, God started to highlight something a little bit differently to me uh, through the, the scripture of the triumphal entry. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 21. We're going to read verse 1 through 11, and I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. Verse 1 says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches of trees and spread them on the road. And then the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And everybody in Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Can you turn the lights up just a little bit more back there? This morning, if you guys are taking notes, the title of this message is Unlikely Heroes. Unlikely Heroes. Let's go ahead and pray, you guys. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for these people in this room. I thank you, God, for the privilege and the opportunity it is to, to speak your word. God, would you use me? Would you speak through me, Father? Lord, as I empty myself out to you, God, I, I give myself over to you right now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Come on. And everybody said, amen. amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I love a good hero story. I just do. I love it when the good guys always win. I love it when God uses people to do extraordinary things. Do you guys uh, remember those, those asteroid movies like Deep Impact and Armageddon? Who, who remembers those movies? Like, I just, I love Armageddon. I love, you know, Bruce Willis, man, that he, he stayed behind, you know, to detonate the bomb on the asteroid that saved the entire world. And, man, when that scene happened, I was bawling my eyes out because he, he made a selfless Act. Well, recently I was reading a story about a man named Wesley Autry. You, you probably don't know this story, but he was a 50-year-old construction worker, a Navy veteran who was working and living in Manhattan. And uh, one, one morning as he was bringing his daughters home uh, from school, or uh, one afternoon, uh, you know, because he had to go to work, he worked the night shift, uh, he was at the subway station. All of a sudden, just to the left of him, uh, a man collapsed on the platform. And so he ran over there, and he grabbed him. He picked him up, and, you know, he's kind of checking him out. And all of a sudden, the guy stumbles back, and he falls on the railroad tracks of the subway station. And all of a sudden, they heard the, the sound of the roar of the train coming. They seen the lights coming. In a split-moment decision, Mr. Autry jumped onto the railroad tracks, and he grabbed this guy, and he held him down as the cars ran over the top of them. And the, the train stopped five cars in, you know, and the crowd just screaming. And, and you know, you hear, you hear people just crying. And all of a sudden, you hear his voice speaking out uh, from underneath the cars. Hey, we're okay down here. But I got two daughters up there. Will you tell them their father is okay? And so Mr. Autry got up, and he went to work just like he does every single day. And on his way home from work, he visited this man in the hospital. And, and he, he told him, I don't feel like a hero I just seen someone who needed help, and I just did it. I, I did what I felt was right in the moment. And I love reading and hearing stories like that because it gives me hope that there's still good people in this world. 
Even though the world is going to hell, okay, it is, it, there's still hope that there's good people in this world and we do good things and, and there's heroes, there's unlikely heroes all over the place. But when we read these stories and we hear them, we only hear about them like on the news or we only hear about them on a movie, like, right, like Armageddon or when we read a book, we only hear about them. But, but, but what about the silent heroes in our life? Well, what about those silent heroes who every day, day in and day out, make those choices to do extraordinary things? And what about the single mom and the single father who's raising, you know, three kids and going to put themselves through school and, and, you know, has working two jobs? I don't know about you, but that's a hero in my book. And what about a high school student living a life of celibacy? amongst a world that is super hyper-sexualized right now. And they, they're doing everything they can to try to get to our children. What about those teens that are living a life of celibacy? There's heroes in my book. Or what about the parents who are trying to raise their kids, again, in this super-sexualized world that they're pouring everything they have into their kids, everything that they got? What about them? Or what about the business owners working tireless hours day in and day out to offer up a service not only to this world but to, to, to help, uh, you know, provide for their family and to provide for the people that work for them in their livelihoods. What about them? Or what about the millions of military veterans who day in and day out put their lives on the line and some have died? I, I read another story about a man named Kyle Carpenter. I don't know if you guys have heard that story or not. He was a Marine uh, a, a veteran and uh, he was the youngest living soldier to ever receive the Medal of Honor. And what happened was in Afghanistan, uh, he literally threw himself on top of his, 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 his buddy he was serving with to shield him from a grenade that got thrown onto the rooftop. Suffered severe damage to his body. I mean, he can't even see. His, it's, he's all deformed. But they both lived because of this man. And see, but we face a problem in our Christian walk. We do. We really do. And, and we look at these stories and we tell ourselves, man, I could never throw myself onto somebody with a grenade in the room. Or, man, I, throwing myself on a railroad tracks of an oncoming train, man, I could, I could never do that. And we read stories in the Bible of ordinary men and women who go on to do extraordinary great things, like, like stopping the mouths of lions, right, or like parting the Red Sea. I don't know about you, but I want to part a Red Sea. Does anybody in here want to, like, try to part you know, I'm at the river sometimes, and I'm like, Jesus, come on, man. You can do this, you know. I want to do that in my life. You know, we read stories about men getting thrown into a fiery furnace and coming out alive, right, not even scorched or scathed. We read stories like Queen Esther who risked her life to go in front of King Xerxes, you know, to, to, to save her entire nation, which was really unheard of because she was a foreign prisoner in a foreign land. You know, we read these things and we tell ourselves, I can never do that. Who am I? Right? God can't use me. Do you know what I've done? Do you know where I've been? Do you know what I just did last night? Come on, God couldn't use a person like me. He couldn't do it. I could never do things like this, right? I, have, I, have, I don't have any time to, to, to be used by God. I'm just so stretched out to the max. And we tell ourselves these things and we disqualify ourselves before we even get a chance to prove ourselves. We really do. It's a problem that we face. I face the same problem myself. But can I just say this about God? That he is a master at taking unlikely, ordinary people like you and me to do extraordinary things. He is a master at doing that. He's a master at taking the insignificant thing in your life, the thing that you deemed as unworthy, the thing that may have been the thing that crippled you. He is the master at taking those things and turning them around and using them to achieve great exploits. And see, as I was reading this text this past week, God started to highlight something to me that I've never really given attention to. And I, I guarantee after you hear it, you're going to be like, I never thought of that as well. And so I was reading, and I, I just thought there was something more about the donkey in the scripture. There's got to be something more. And so as I'm reading, as I'm reading, I'm reading, all of a sudden God started to highlight something to me. And at the beginning of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all, all, three, uh, all three books, they make it a point to talk about this story in the donkey. They make it a specific point to tell you, hey, this is what Jesus did, right? He told his disciples to go into the village, and when you enter the village, you're going to find a donkey tied there, uh, a colt, and, a, you know, so untie it and bring him here to me. Oh, and by the way, if the owner tells you, hey, what are you doing with this donkey, just tell him the Lord needs it and he'll give it to you. <laughs> what? I mean, it would be the equivalent of uh, 
of somebody rocking up to your house and jumping into your red Chevy Silverado truck. Any Chevy fans out there? Where are my, where are my Chevy fans at? Just a few in this one. I know you got a red truck. And you're just letting them have it. That's, that's the equivalent, man. When you had cattle back in the Old Testament, you had money, you had something. This was your livelihood. And you don't just give out your donkey to somebody without knowing, you know, the cost or anything like that. You just, you just, he just gave it away. But did you ever stop to think that even though you read that and this seems insignificant, God was using the owner of this donkey to fulfill a prophecy that was spoken by the prophet Zechariah 550 years prior to this happening. How amazing is that, that 550 years later, all of a sudden, the owner of this donkey is fulfilling biblical prophecy. That blows my mind, that God would use him in such a way. In Zechariah 9.9, it says this, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. He's humble, and he's mounted on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Can I just say that God uses things in our life that we deem insignificant and small, and he uses them to do great exploits. He really does. He uses your stuff. He uses your mess to achieve and accomplish his purpose, which is great exploits. The Bible is full of men and women that God used to do extraordinary things. I mean, in John chapter 6, he used a little boy and his lunch, right? He had two fish and two loaves of bread, and he used this little boy, and he used his lunch to feed 5,000 men. And that's not counting the women and children who were in the room. They, the scholars think that there was upwards of 10 to 12 to 15,000 people who could have been there, all because a little boy was willing to give up his lunch to Jesus and bring Jesus what he had. And God used, and God used a little boy. I'm telling you, we're going into a day and age where God is going to start using our children. We have a remnant of children rising up in this church that are firehouses, man. They don't have no junior Holy Spirit on the inside of them, man. They are rising up so God can use anyone. In John chapter 4, he used a woman at the well, a Samaritan woman. And if you know anything about the, 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 the Bible, Jews don't, don't talk to Samaritans. They, they, they don't like them. They're the outcasts of society. And so even the fact that Jesus was standing at the well, not only talking to a woman, but talking to a Samaritan was, was crazy. But he used her to save her entire village. Because she went back and said, man, let, let, me, let me show you a man that showed me everything that I ever had was and everything I was. And they came back, and because of that, her entire village was saved. She was living in sin. She wasn't married. She was, you know, dating a guy that, that she wasn't married to. And prior to that, she had several other husbands, but God used her. Come on, he used a fearful man who was hiding in despair by the name of Gideon to defeat a Midianite army with just 300 soldiers. With just 300 soldiers. He used a prostitute named Rahab to help out the Hebrew spies that came into the city. Oh, and by the way, did you know Jesus' lineage is named in the, in, the, in, the, in the prostitute Rahab's lineage? I bet you didn't know that, did you? It is so awesome and amazing that God can use a prostitute to save, to, 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 to hide the Hebrew spies, to let them out of a window so that they don't get killed by, 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 by her kingdom. He used a ruddy little shepherd boy by the name of David. To take out a giant named Goliath, come on, if he can use a donkey in Numbers 22 to get a message across to Balaam, I guarantee that he can use you and me. He can use your mess. He can use the stuff that you've been through. He can use your life. He can use you right now in this moment. You don't have to wait for another day. You don't have to wait to be used by God. You can be used by God today, right now, with everything you are going through. Can you believe a donkey talked in the scripture? It's hard to believe, but it happened. It really is. Can I just say, Shrek? Did you say Shrek? <laughs> Shrek. Can I just say that God uses unlikely people like you and me to do extraordinary things? And so as I was studying this this past week, I began to ask the question, what separates these people 
you know, these people that do great things. You know, the, Mr. Autry and, you know, the, you know, the, the Marine and, you know, the, the stories that we read in the Bible. What separates these people from like you and me? What is it about them? What kind of superpower do they have? You know, is it, do they have just something inside of them that just makes them turn into Batman on the moment or, or Superman or whatever that is? Is there something in there? And I believe God started to speak to me a simple word. It's a simple three-letter word. But the three-letter word is so powerful that it has the power to unlock your destiny. It has the power to change the course and trajectory of your life. It even has the power to send you to heaven or send you to hell. This word is so powerful, and the answer to this word is a very simple yes. It's Y, it's E, and it's yes. It is yes. There is power in your yes to Jesus. There is power in your yes. The only thing that stands in the way of your destiny, of God achieving things in your life, is just a simple three-letter word, and it's yes. If you think about all the people in the scriptures who did these things, they had to come to a point in their life where they said yes. They did. They had to come to that point. They had to come to the point to where they said, you know what, God? Yes, I'm going to give you my yes. There is power in your yes. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're finally getting somewhere. (laughs) Now turn to the other neighbor and say, I was tracking all along. Don't try to say that to me. (laughs) You know, at the end of 2015, um, my wife and I, we moved to City Point. It was December of 2016, uh, 15. And, you know, we moved and felt God calling us here and stuff like that. And at the beginning of 2016, God started to speak to me. And I've always known that I've had a calling on my life. You know, ever since I was younger, you know, um, in, in the early 90s, at our, our global senior pastor's Mark Ramsey's church back in the 90s, uh, it, back in Denver, like he prophesied over me that I was going to be a pastor one day. So I knew I had this calling on my life. But I was so afraid of it, you guys. I was so scared. Being up on this stage used to terrify me. It used to scare me so bad that confession time, I would literally lie to get out of it. I really would. Oh, God, I got a stomach ache, you know, like, oh, man, hey, hey, we need you to, we need you to do this uh, announcement. Oh, man, gosh, I just came down with something just instantly, you know, and just like, just something, you know, it's true. That was six years ago, you know, I've repented, confessed, you know, there's freedom, uh, you know, got some ministry time for it. But I would, man, because I knew, I knew the calling, but something about it terrified me so much. I don't know what it was to get in front of people and do what I'm doing now. It used to be completely terrifying to my, my wife knows. But I, I, okay, so I said, okay, God, we're January of 2016, and I said, God, I know you have a gift of calling on my life, but there's nothing inside of me, Lord, that wants to do it. <laughs> I'm sorry, God. I don't want to get up there. There's nothing in me. So if you want me to do this, then you're going to have to do it in me. It's just a funny moment, like I'm negotiating with the Savior of the world, right? Like, like the God who is giving me my very next breath. I'm sitting there negotiating back and forth with Have you ever negotiated with God? And so I said, God, I'm so fearful. I said, okay, Ricks, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to say yes to me. That's it. Just say yes and watch me do the rest. Watch me do the rest. And so what I did is I dubbed. I said, okay, God, I'm going to give you a year. Isn't that funny, right? He's giving me my next breath, and I'm telling him, I'm going to give him a year. I'm going to give you a year, God. And so I dubbed 2016 my year of yes, where no matter what Pastor Aaron asked me to do, I was going to say yes. I didn't care if it made me look stupid. I didn't care if I sounded like an idiot. I didn't care. I just wanted God to outwork something in me. And so I said yes to everything. And slowly but surely, guess what? God started to outwork some stuff in me. He really did. He started to outwork this gift in me. I started to grow. And I I apologize if you guys were there in those early days of me getting on this platform, okay? (laughs) It was rough, okay? I'm not going to lie. I was standing up there just shaking with my phone, and it looked like I was, you know, convulsing up there. But I was just so nervous. But, man, God started to do something. And I got to the end of 2016, and I said, okay, God, I'm going to give you another year. He's like, great. And so I, I gave him another year, and all of a sudden, you know, I, I, this, he started to outwork this gifting and this calling in my life. And he started to unlock my destiny and my future. And as I said yes more, he started to grow me. He started to expand my territory. It was just so awesome that I'm standing up here today, and I can say, God, you did this in me. You did it. But I had to say yes. I had to say yes. 
It's hot in here. It is very hot. <laughs> Anybody else hot? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me get under the, there's like a, a wave right here that I can. So the owner of this donkey who said yes, he didn't know that he was going to be used in such a mighty way. He didn't. He didn't know that. He didn't know that the donkey that he gave to the Lord was literally going to be carrying the Savior of the entire world on his back. When you look at that and you put that into perspective, here we have Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, is going to be riding in my Chevy truck? Are you kidding me? He's going to be riding on my donkey? He didn't know that. He didn't know that 2,000 plus years later we were going to still be talking about him from this platform. He didn't know, but God used him because he said, yes. And even though it seemed insignificant, God used him to deliver the Paschal Lamb to Jerusalem. And if you know anything about that, you know the Paschal Lamb was the one lamb that was chosen to represent the entire nation. The lamb that was spotless. The lamb that was blameless. And this was going to be the lamb that was going to be sacrificed to wipe out the sins of Israel for that year. Literally riding on the back of this donkey, Israel is literally choosing the Paschal Lamb in this moment. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Now, here's what I'm not saying, because I know what some of you are thinking. I'm not saying say yes to everything. I'm not, because some of you have an issue. You do say yes to everything. You have a hard time saying no. <laughs> and, and you say yes, and you say yes, and then you burn out, and then there's people that come and take advantage of you, and they ask you because they know you'll say yes, and then they know you won't turn you down, and then you burn yourself out, and you, you, you fight. you're like, why, God, why am I burned out, but here's what I'm saying. This is very important, you guys. What I'm saying is that God already has yeses written on your heart. He already has yeses fashioned in your book. He already has them written on your heart. But when your yes meets with the call of God on your life, all of a sudden destiny gets unlocked in your life and you begin to thrive and you begin to walk and you begin to experience all the fullness of God because now all of a sudden my life has purpose. Now all of a sudden my life has meaning. Now all of a sudden I'm living and breathing in the will of God because my yes met with him, because my yes met with his destiny, because my yes interlined with his yes and I became who God has called me to be. Your yes is so important it is so important when your yes meets with the call of God in your life destiny is unlocked and you begin to walk and you begin to thrive and you begin to just feel a sense of, 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 of fulfillment and purpose and, and dreaming. Like, wow, God is using me. He's finally using me. Come on, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, for all the promises of God, all of them, every promise of God in him are yes and amen. They are yes and amen. Everything that God has for you, every promise he has towards you, his plans, his purposes for you, guess what the answer is? They're yes and they're Amen. He has them written down on your heart, but it comes down to us saying yes to him. Think about our father Abraham. This microphone is really, my back is sweaty, so it's like pulling down, you know, it's getting all sweaty up here. I need a rag like uh, T.D. Jakes, you know, just kind of. <laughs> that man can sweat. Bro. Oh, thank you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, wifey. Yes. <laughs> I think about I think about our father Abraham. Because of his yes, back in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 22 when he was asked to offer up his own son Isaac on the altar and so what did he do? He put him on a donkey and he rode him to the mountain, which is a foreshadowing of this very story that we are reading. And he went up there and he went to sacrifice him and God stopped and he said, wait, I was just testing you. I got a ram in the thicket, uh, but thank you that you have not withheld your only begotten son. And then he says this in Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. He says, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. Do we have that slide? Thank you. The sand uh, uh, that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. 
I love that. Your offspring, the offspring of Abraham, shall possess the gate of his enemies. Shall possess the gate of your enemies coming in and going out. So they will control your enemies coming in and going out. And that's what I love about how, what God says in, in Psalm, that he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. But then he says this. In verse 18, he says, And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. I mean, just think about that for a minute, that we are standing in the promise of our father Abraham right now, that you and I are able to, 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 to be in this, to, 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 to glean from this yes that he made in the book of Genesis. He said yes to God, and all of a sudden, all the nations of the earth are blessed, and we get to partake and participate in this. And can I just say that your yes today will be a future blessing for your offspring tomorrow? It really is. You don't know what's coming down the line. You don't know what two, three, four, five generations from here, if we are still here, there, there is down the line. Okay, You don't know that, so your yes today could be a blessing for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. Wouldn't that be awesome that your grandkids, great-grandkids, great-great-great-great-great-grandkids one day can sit back and talk about how their mom or dad, father, mother made a yes, and it changed the course of our family's trajectory. It changed the course of our life. You see, our family, my family, we, we grew up in poverty. You know, we were on food stamps and we were on, you know, uh, you, you know welfare and all those things, eating, you know, the government boxes and, and all those things. We, I grew up in that, but you know what? I told myself that is not going to be my heritage. That is not going to be my lineage. So when I said yes to Jesus, all of that stuff was cut off. And now because of my yes, my kids and their kids and their kids will not have to grow up in poverty because it stopped in Jesus Christ. Your yes today can be a future blessing to your children tomorrow. Can I just say that God uses unlikely ordinary heroes like you and me with a willing heart to say yes, to do extraordinary things. He really does. He really does. Is Joe, i seen Joe walking up early. Can I have Joe up? Would you say this? You say, Pastor Rick, that all sounds good. But you don't know my life. I own a business. I have multiple kids. I have a spouse. I got a full-time job. I got two jobs. I got three jobs. I got kids. I got sports. I got all these things. And, and, and you know, I got all this stuff going on. And sometimes I can't even make it to church on Sunday because my life is so busy. Oh, and now you're telling me that I need to say yes to more stuff. And I can't even handle the yeses that are in my life. But can I just say that saying yes to God and doing great things, it doesn't automatically mean to sell everything you own and move to Africa to be a missionary. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that you gotta get some skinny jeans, a cool shirt, and a microphone. <laughs> it's a cool shirt, I love it. It's so comfy too. Like this. To stand up, it doesn't mean, it doesn't automatically mean that. <laughs> Don't make me laugh, bro. <laughs> but while that may be true for some, for the majority of us, it's not true. It's just not true. But what needs to happen is this, is we need to stop compartmentalizing our life. I have my church compartment. I got my work compartment. I got my family compartment. I got my hobby compartment. I got my friends compartment. And a lot of times, you know, we're like, oh, I don't want, the, I don't want them to intermix. I don't want my, my friend's compartment to intermix with my church compartment. You know, oh, no, the church is just for church, man. We're going to leave that there. We're not going to talk about that when we go to the store. We're not going to talk about Jesus, you know, because they told us to not talk about religion and politics. So I'm not going to do that at the family dinner, you know. And it's like, man, we got all these compartments that we live from. But Jesus has called us to one life. Christianity is not uh, uh, something we do. It's who you are. It's a lifestyle that we live. We live the lifestyle of Christianity. We live the lifestyle of ministry and every single thing. So we need to take these compartments and combine them into one, into our life, into Christ's life and have him outworking in us. If you own a business in this room, guess what? Your business is your ministry. It is. Your business is your ministry. If you're married, you have a spouse, you have kids, guess what? Your family is your ministry. That is your ministry. 
If you're in school right now, whether at the grade level or college, guess what? That's your ministry. Those school grounds are your ministry. It's not something we do. It's who we are. We're Christians everywhere we go. And if, if we are tuned into God's voice, when he asks us to do something, when he asks us for a yes, if we're tuned into that and we give him that and we partner with him, all of a sudden the yes that, that we give him is going to be used by him right where you are at. You don't need to wait to be in Sunday service to praise him. You don't have to wait until the pastor asks you to go pray for somebody, to pray for somebody. This is your life. Christianity is our lifestyle. Jesus is our lifestyle. And we're called to live it out 24, day, 24 hours, seven days a week. No compartments. Everything working together. So glorious and so full. Saying yes to God in everything we do. You know what saying yes to him might look like? It might look like being nice to someone giving them an encouraging word, telling them they look good today. Saying yes to him might look like praying for your neighbor or praying for that woman or man in the grocery store. It might look like a late night phone call to a friend who's struggling, checking in, hey, how you doing, man? I just want to check on you. Letting our family know that Jesus loves them. It, 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 it may look different. If you own a business, it might look like operating it with integrity instilling biblical morals and biblical values into your employees, sewn in the very fab fabric of the mission statement of your company, using it to build and further and advance God's kingdom. For families and single parents, saying yes to him might not be something you do, but it might be someone you raise. It may be someone you raise. You may just be raising the next Billy Graham. You may just be raising, you know, the next David Kalenda or, or somebody who's going to go on to do great exploits and be somebody for the kingdom. And so don't get too hard on yourself, parents who are working full-time jobs and who have kids right now. Don't get so hard on yourself because you are raising godly children, husbands and wives. What would your marriage look like if you truly laid down your life for your spouse together? Not one or the other together. It takes two to tangle, but laying down your life for your spouse, that is your first love, that is your first ministry. What would your marriage look like if you gave God a year and said, God, well, I'm gonna give you a year and we're gonna do this thing together. We're gonna seek you out together. That's your ministry. I wanna ask you this question as we close. Will you be the unlikely hero of your story? Will you? Will you be the unlikely hero of your story? Will you be a stand-up Christian in a bow-down world as the, as the world just throws everything? And I'm here to tell you guys, don't be surprised that the world is in the state that it's in. We know who, we know who, who the God of this world is. We know that the enemy operates in lies. He operates in deception. And if he can get you to believe a lie, guess what? He's got you. The enemy's a liar and he's the father of lies. Don't be surprised that Disney's doing what it's doing. They're from the world. They're of the world. They're operating by worldly standards and, 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 and worldly guidelines. But will you be that? Will you be the stand-up Christian in this world that this world needs right now? Come on, you were born for greatness. You were born to be different. You were born to stand out. You were born to stand up. You were born to push back the kingdom of darkness in this generation and in this time. You and I were born to be together, together for such a time as this to outwork the giftings and the callings and the miracles of God on our life for this generation right now. You were born to be different. You were. So don't tell yourself that God can't use me. Because I think I laid out a pretty extensive list of people that God used that had no business being used by him. When you look at all the characters of the Bible and their flaws, God used every single one of them. He's looking for people like you and me this Easter season to be like the owners of the donkey. Or to be like the donkey. To carry the message into your city. 
to carry the message of hope to your family, to your friends, to carry the message of hope to your coworkers, to your employees, whatever that is. He is looking for people like you and me to say yes to him in a world who constantly tells him no. He is looking for ordinary people, ordinary heroes, to do extraordinary things and great exploits by simply saying yes. Yes, that's it. That's all it takes. But when you say yes and you trust in him and you step out over that chicken line and you do one more step and you do one more step, all of a sudden God will start to outwork inside of you something that you never even dreamed of. It says that no eye has seen and no ear has heard nor has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. There's a destiny written on your heart. And the key to unlock that is yes. That's it. So I want to pray as we close. I felt like for this service, there was two groups of people that I want to pray for. And I'm not excluding anybody, but I just feel like God is highlighting some, some people in here. So if you're a family that have kids that still live at home, please stand to your feet. I have a heart for families, you guys, because I know the sacrifice. Raising kids is the most selfless act a person could do, because you literally deny yourself of everything that you have, and you invest and you pour into your children. There's late nights, there's sick days, there's so much that goes into that, there's sports, there's everything. We, your parents, you guys are doing an amazing job raising your kids. And there's a yes written on your heart to instill biblical morals and values in those children, to go on and do great exploits. And I just feel like there's this weight on your shoulders. And Jesus is saying today, I'm going to lift the weight off your shoulders and I'm going to let you feel how light and airy it could be when you just say yes to me. Thank you for saying yes to your kids. Thank you for being here because Lord knows when you have a family, even showing up on Sunday, man, is a, it's, that's half the battle, man, just getting here. The car right here, oh my gosh. Some of those words that fly out of your mouth, man, I will beat you if you don't listen and sit in your seat. Then you get in the church, hey guys, how you doing? We're doing great, yes, we're here. Yes, go in there, thank you very much, you know? And it's like, so I know the struggle, man. It's so hard. But your kids need you, and they love you. So put your hands towards heaven. Father, I thank you for the parents. And even if, even if you don't have kids living at home, this could be for you too. God, would you bless the parents right now in Jesus' name? Would you take away the burden, God? Would you lift the heaviness off of them, Father, right now in this moment, God? Would you begin to, to speak life and destiny into their hearts again? Once again, God, would you let them feel the enrapture of their first love, which is you, God? Lord, would you begin to download in their hearts, God, ways that they can instill into their children, ways that they can give them what they need, God, uh, financial blessings, financial miracles, Father, to raise, Lord, the next Billy Graham or the next evangelist or the next revivalist or the next, the, the next, the, the next child who is going to take the gospel into the nation. God, I just pray for a blessing right now in Jesus' name. Take the weight, God, and let him feel your peace. God, I say peace be still in the family unit. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The second group I want to pray for is the business owners in our church. If you own a business, can you stand up, please? I want to applaud you guys. Because I know how hard it is. I know the tireless hours you guys work, week in and week out, day in and day out, month after month, year after year. You got the weight of the world on your shoulder. Am I going to make, are we going to make enough this year to supply for my family's needs? Am I going to have enough money to cover, uh, you know, uh, to cover the, the paychecks of my employees? Is there going to be enough coming in? And then you got this fire to put out and that fire to put out. You got to come home and you're trying to separate your business from your personal life, but you just can't do it because when you're a business owner, you work 24-7. And so I applaud you guys. Thank you for your yes. Thank you for your yes. Let's lift our hands and pray. Father, I thank you for these incredible men and women in this church who have said yes, God, to provide, an, uh, to provide a business, God. Lord, I know the, white, the, the night tarot that they go through sometimes. 
I know, God, the wants and the needs and the desires, Father. If only I had enough. If only I could get out of debt. If only this, God, I pray right now, God, that you would lift those burdens off of them in Jesus' name. Father, and I speak life. I speak destiny. I speak blueprints, God. I speak strategies, God. Kingdom strategies right now to be downloaded in these entrepreneurs' life. God, kingdom strategies, Lord, to advance the kingdom, to press forward and press in in this dark age, God, when the government is coming after their business, when everything else fails, God, that you would give them a strategy to grow, to multiply for your kingdom, to advance your kingdom. Thank you for these incredible, incredible people. Bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So the last thing I want to pray for, there's one yes that has the power to unlock death and life in your life, and that's a yes to Jesus. I mean, we're celebrating that this, past, this next week. The whole reason Jesus came to this earth is so that he could die on a cross and be raised from the dead. Why? So that you and I can have life and life more abundantly so we can have eternal life. And the Bible says that if you confess him with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. You will be saved. You'll be transferred into the kingdom. You, you will come from darkness and be transferred into light. And the, and the Bible talks about repentance, that there's got to be this godly sorrow to fill your heart to say, you know what, I don't want to live the way that I'm living anymore. It's not working for me. I need Jesus in my life. And all you have to do, my friend, is say a simple yes to Jesus. Is there anybody in here who say, you know what, yes, Pastor Rick, I need to say yes to Jesus this morning. I want to give my life back to him. I want to I recommit my life back to him. If there's anybody, can you just give me a wave right now? Right now, in Jesus' name. As I look all the room, we got one back here. Awesome decision, my friend. Awesome decision. Is there anyone else that would say, yes, Pastor Rick, I need to. I need to give my life to Christ right now. Anybody online? All right, my friend, we're going to say the simple prayer together. And again, it's just a yes to Jesus. You're not praying to a mere man. You're praying to him himself. And the Bible says that when you do this thing, that he will come and dwell inside of you and that you will be set on this trajectory. Your course of your life will change forever. Is it going to be hard? Yes. Are you going to have tough times? Yes. And I can't promise you that he'll deliver you from those things, but I can promise you that your life will never be the same. And so can we all pray with this incredible gentleman as we pray? Just repeat this prayer for me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus. I know I'm a sinner, and I know I need a Savior, God. I confess you as Lord. I believe that you rose from the dead. Would you come and make your home in me? Change me. Renew me. Restore me. I confess my sin to you right now, and I commit my life to you this time more and forevermore. Jesus' mighty name I pray. Come on, and everybody said, can we give God an incredible round of applause? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.